starting with the probability and impact matrix. Now the main purpose here is to evaluate the risks and to determine their severity. And what I mean by severity is that each risk will be prioritized within this matrix and the severity, if you will, is the result of multiplying the priority scale against the impact scale. So let me just draw you to these scales before we look at the data. Probability is here on a scale of 0.1 to 0.9. If you will, 10% to 90% probability. We don't show 100% because of course 100% isn't a risk. It means it actually will happen, so it's an issue. And these scales aren't arbitrary. Here you can see the ranking of the highest value here is from 71 to 90%. The previous one is 51 to 70% and so on. And very low is up to 10%. Having a brief description of each is helpful. Very low, low, medium, high and very high. But now let's look at impact. We seem to have some slightly different scales here. You'll find the descriptions are still the same from very low, low, medium, high and very high, but the scales are slightly different. This starts at 0 0.05. Now you may be asking yourself, why is this? A fair question. Well, the reason is this. Let's take an average risk where its probability is 50% and its impact is 50%. Okay, so that's 0.5 for both scales. So in terms of probability, this would score a medium. So in terms of probability, that would sit here, mid-scale. But when you come to look at impact, 0.5 would be between high and very high. In other words, the reason for the choice of different numbers is the fact that impact is seen as a more severe metric. So the values are skewed to make for a given number the impact higher than probability, if that makes good sense to you. That is a given. What happens now is that because we've got a five by five matrix here, we can come up with a 25 field matrix, if you will. And all that happens is that we multiply these numbers for each of the matrices, for those risks that are very low and very mild up to the most severe risks. Let me fill in some numbers for you. So the very first field here would be the result of multiplying 0.9 by 0 0.05, which gives you 0 0.045. If I now fill in the remainder of these grey coloured risk examples, it'll look something like this. In each case, each number is the result of multiplying its probability number by its impact number. So let's perform the same multiplication with the next grouping, if you will. Don't worry about why I've chosen these particular cells, if you will. I'll explain that very, very shortly. So again, these are just the multiplication of these particular relevant numbers. 0.7 times 0.2 gives you 0.14 as an example. Next up, the red grouping, if you will. It's exactly the same thing has happened in that we simply multiply. Let's take this one as an example. 0.9 times 0.2 gives you 0.18. Good. Now here's what's interesting about this. By virtue of the scales we've chosen, check out these actual numbers. In fact, let me start at the very top and let's work our way down looking for the next lowest cell in each case. 0.72, the next one down would be 0.56. The next one down from that would be 0.4. The next one down from that, however, won't be this one, but it'll be 0.36. Then again, 0.28, and then 0.24, and then 0.2, and then 0.18, and then 0.14, and then 0.12, and you see the idea here. So what we've got here is a ranking system that we can use to prioritize the severity of each risk. And the severity, I'll say again, is the multiplication of probability by impact. Let's take an invented example of two particular risks to do with the weather. Imagine that you've been told that there's an 80% chance of rain and a 20% chance of snow. If it rains, local roads will flood and make traveling by car difficult and slow. If it snows, and let's assume this is a country where if it does snow, it's quite heavy, then roads will be blocked and people won't be able to do any travel. You can see that the snow one is more severe in terms of its impact. But to make a good risk judgment, we need to consider its probability, only 20%, versus rain, which is 80%. But the impact for rain 
is very much lower. So multiplying the two together, and I don't need to do that in that invented example, you can see at least will give you a common metric that you can use to rank and prioritize the two different risks themselves and put appropriate resources into both potential outcomes. Now we've got these numbers here, there's something else we can do, and it's the reason why I've colored these particular cells differently. Starting with the gray ones, you could take the view that since these numbers are all pretty low, then for any risks within the risk register that scored these types of numbers, that you'd accept the risk and do nothing about it. And we're coming to responses later in this particular module, and you'll learn that accept and do nothing is a legitimate potential response to make if you feel it's appropriate. So what about the pink rated scores in the middle? Well, you could decide that those are the risks that you intend to take some other form of action on. I've nearly named it as proactive, meaning do something now. Whereas any risks in the red section, you might consider the scores are so severe that they need to be escalated and discussed with senior management as an example. But the colouring scheme I've used here was fairly arbitrary on, on my part. For example, the risk tolerance of your organisation might mean it's only the top three or four here that you'd want to escalate. But the principle is what I'm trying to put across in this particular slide. So this is the probability and impact matrix, very important tool, which you'll almost certainly come across. But there's a second tool which you might also see or hear about. And this, this second tool is particularly useful for when reporting risks. Let's have a look at it as it's very similar because it also uses probability and impact. One of the names for it is the summary risk profile. And notice again probability and impact here from very low to very high for both axes as the probability and impact matrix showed. But what we do here, we simply place a symbol, here shown as a red circle with a risk number in it, of each risk and where they appear on this continuum. So rather than concentrating on the values, we're looking at where they sit. For example, risk number nine has a very high probability of happening, and if it does happen, it'll have a very high impact. Whereas risk number one, although if it occurs, it has a very high impact, it's a very low probability, perhaps similar to it snowing in my previous invented example. Whereas risk number six is very unlikely to happen, and even if it happened, it would have a very low impact. Probably a good candidate, would you agree, for choosing the action of accept and do nothing. And this particular simple diagram, perhaps taking the most important risks here, would be very useful to form part of the standard reports that a, that a project manager would give to management throughout a typical project. There's a couple of extra things you can do here, similar to the first, and that's that you could have an escalation line here where these risks were seen as intolerable. And the second thing is you can show trends. So if in month number one, risk number one was scored as a medium, but now in this latest report, it's moved to very high in terms of impact, you might be expected to include some information to management telling them why this has occurred and what you'll be doing about it. And it's an interesting point, isn't it? Since six, it would be seen as a fairly harmless risk, while risk nine would be potentially very dangerous. What you'd want to do, and what management might expect a project manager to do, would be that by taking some form of action to try and take each of these risks and move them closer to the origin, if that's possible, on the probability and impact scale.